introduce our guest this evening. I guess we're kind of his guests too. Yeah, I, yeah, I certainly would. It is my great pleasure. I mean, you know, none of us would be here tonight, and I, and I just I just don't mean because of RFRX, we wouldn't have this organization. So yes, Dr. Dower Ray is the founder and president of this very organization, Recovering from Religion. He's been a psychologist for over thirty years and the author of four books, including The God Virus, How Religion Infects Our Lives and Culture, and Sex and God, How Religion Distorts Sexuality. Dr. Ray has been a student of religion most of his life and holds a master's degree in religion, as well as a bachelor's degree in sociology, anthropology, with a doctorate in psychology. Welcome, Dr. Ray. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Kara. Uh, Kara, we know you're helping people. And, and as a result of that, I've asked Gail to double your volunteer salary. So, Ooh, I'm yeah. so rich. <laughs> Amazing. You're going you're gonna to have that big, big, you're going to get the big bucks. <laughs> big atheist money. Yeah, Yeah. right, right. <laughs> Helen's been getting it all along, but you're finally going to get some of it. Maybe she'll share some of hers with you. Ooh. Anyway. Thanks for having me. Uh, I have been looking forward to this talk. Uh, Helen um, was uh, involved in an earlier talk I did a couple of months ago. And this, uh, this is a subject I've been looking at literally for 20 years. I've never, I've never really sat down and said, okay, I want to put this together and, and really understand what, what we're looking at here. So to, tonight is my second effort to do this. Um, this is not an easy thing to talk about. And uh, I hope you'll listen um, carefully to what I have to say and formulate your questions, because I think some of the stuff I'm going to say is 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 worth debating. Let's just put it that way. And I'm not here to say I've got the right answers. I hope I've got the right questions, but I'm I'm pretty sure I don't have all the right answers. And a year or two from now, <laughs> who knows? I might change my mind on some of this. But for now, this is kind of where I'm where I'm at. So to begin with, I think it's helpful to try and look at us as a species uh, how, how, and look at how we function. What are our tendencies? And finally, how does culture impact our behavior? Now, those are all wound together. So it's not easy thing to do to, to, to see how this all works and how culture impacts us and how our biology does. But that's what we're going to try and do. I think we can make some best guesses and estimates uh, about our behavior and our sexual tendencies. Uh, if, if we have an open perspective and, and try to include cross-cultural comparisons, uh, even cross-cultural and cross-species comparisons, I think, I think we can really learn a lot by looking at other cultures and looking at other species. And we'll do some of that tonight. We're going to be using both of these methods to understand the cultural and behavioral movements that we're seeing today. And I hope to explore some of the interesting ideas um, about men, women, sex, sexuality, that I believe are impacting a wide range of behavior and fundamentally changing our patterns of mating and relating to each other. So I'm going to begin with two hypotheses. First, we are in a time of very rapid change that is upsetting old patterns of sexual relations and behavior. Hypothesis two, men and women are impacted by these changes, but the impact on men has not been widely explored or understood. Now, I will not be specifically discussing trans or non-binary identities. They are certainly impacted by what I'm gonna talk about, but I'm just gonna be focusing mainly on people who identify mainly as male or female. So first, let's begin with something that may seem obvious. A male animal who does not have the right mating ritual will not find a mate. For example, a male songbird who does not have the right mating songs will not be attractive to the female of that species. These things are somewhat inherited in many animals, but in many songbirds, in fact, virtually all songbirds, there is a lot of learning required to learn the right songs for a specific territory. If you take a songbird to a different territory, the local songs may be so different that females will not respond. In other words, birds have culture. <laughs> uh, in fact, some of the research on songbirds even calls it bird culture. 
In many songbird species, the male actually spends a good deal of time in adolescence learning the songs that will make him uh, help him find a mate later. Of utmost importance, the adolescent generally learns his songs from his father or from other dominant male tutors in the immediate environment. Without good male role models around, the adolescent songbird will have a hard time learning the songs that will get him a mate later in life. And I want you to keep this in mind as we talk tonight. So birds, that, that was birds, songbirds. Not all birds are like that, but songbirds are. So I just want to be clear about that. Now let's look at humans. Humans have almost no genetic program for mating. Basically, our brain says, watch the world around you and learn from the local environment and the signals for mating. You learn how to mate from your local culture. You aren't, I mean, a, a cockroach knows how to mate. It's genetic right in, in them, but it's, that's not the way we do it. We could see that mating rituals and beauty standards can vary dramatically across cultures. For example, body types that are attractive can vary very widely across cultures. This is so obvious that we don't even think about it. Why do some people in African tribes have what is called steopigia, or very, very large butts? Or women in other cultures have very small breasts, and cultures just a few hundred miles away, many women have large breasts. What is going on here? Obviously, genetics has something to do with it. But human cultures literally are breeding us. Just like we breed hogs and pigeons and chickens, we are breeding ourselves unconsciously. Not only are beauty standards and attractiveness standards quite different from culture to culture, but mating signals can vary dramatically as well. Uh, okay. Kara is an anthropologist, so I'm a little self-conscious about this. <laughs> oh, you're great. This is this is exciting. I'm super excited for this. I'm I'm not only an anthropologist, but I'm also super interested in human and non-human animal interactions. So okay. hearing you talk about other species and their culture gets me excited. All right. Well, we'll get you excited then. So just as with songbirds, human males need to know the local signals that will attract a mate. To find a mate, men have to search and seek, just like women have to search and seek. Mating is a product of specific activities between potential partners. If you just, I mean, I, this is really clinical, uh, scientific, if you will, but I, I think we could all agree that's, that's pretty much the way nature works, and we're a part of nature. So just as songbirds, human males need to know the local signals that will attract a mate. To find a mate, men have to search and seek, like I said earlier. To be successful, males require interacting, talking, experimenting, and generally learning how to interact with real humans. It takes a lot of practice and experience to learn these skills for men and for women. Unfortunately, this level of interaction has been interrupted by many factors in our current culture. So, so to kind of summarize, what I've just said is to, to really learn and successfully learn how to find a mate or interact, you need face-to-face -face contact. You need to real-time um, human, flesh-to-flesh, ear-to-ear, eye-to-eye contact. That's the way our species learns how to interact and then to find a mate. So here's some ways that's been disrupted, though. New ways of dating and finding makes have been introduced. Online dating often carries an implied promise that it's easy as swaying left or right to find a partner. There are several psychological and neurological issues with, with this approach. Mainly, it sets unrealistic expectations about finding someone. Research shows that 70% of members of online dating services are men. And those men are generally only interested in the top 20% of women based only on looks. I mean, think about that. You got 70% of the members are men. <laughs> That's a huge imbalance to begin with. 
On the other side, women are only interested in the top 20% of men based on apparent access to resources. There's actually quite a bit of research on this lately. So men are only interested in women who have good looks or the, or the looks of their culture, whatever that is. And women are only interested in the top 20% of men that look like they've got resources. They look rich. They've got a good suit on or whatever. This means that trying to date online involves a huge amount of rejection and leaves, leaves someone open to all sorts of deception and games. And those games get played all the time on internet dating services. I speak from some experience here. I was in, involved in the internet dating world way back in 2000, the year 2000, when it was first getting started. And I, I interacted on dating uh, services for about 10 years. Now I know a lot has changed in those 10 years, but I really saw, I, I almost did it not just personally for dating purposes, but to really see psychologically what was going on because I could see this was an important new uh, development. I, at the time, I didn't know if it was good or bad. I'm sure it's good in some ways, it's bad in others. There's a second thing that's interrupt, interrupted uh, us, and that is new beauty and attraction standards that are being implanted in our brains without our knowledge or permission. These standards impact our choices and are often outside of our consciousness. As an example, I, I, I read this funny and very fun book by Alexander McCall called The Number One Ladies Detective Agency. It's about Madame Precious Ramatsui. I never can, I'm not sure if I know how to pronounce her name. And it's about her detective work in Botswana, Africa. Madame Ramatsui complains that she is a woman with a big butt. When she was growing up, all the men were attracted to her. But nowadays, men are only looking at women with small butts, like in the magazines. This little incident in a novel is playing out all over the world. Beauty and attraction standards are being imposed on our brains through the movies we view, the magazines we read, the porn we watch. People all over the world are often in a race to reform themselves into the latest attraction standard. This is a confusing game that some people are good at playing. Others have great difficulty playing this game. Now, it's a biological game we're playing. We want to mate. We want to reproduce. That's a drive that we all have. But it's still a game, just like it is with the songbird. You have to learn the songs. So you may think my songbird analogy is a bit far off. But I will submit that birds have less to learn than humans about mating. So it's not, and it's not just humans, it's all in nature. Males have to push the right buttons to attract a female and reproduce. In humans, men and women have to learn how to interact in order to find a compatible mate. It takes work and, a, and attention to learn these skills. And Dr. Ray, I love yeah. that you brought up the fact that the skills, like, like with the bird societies you mentioned, with human societies too, the skills that people are going to be most successful with and the traits and the attributes are going to vary depending on where they are. And I just posted a link in the chat to an article I read recently about how in South Korea, uh, ideas about the attractiveness of men with muscles or large muscles, like they go to the gym a lot, is in some ways opposite uh, to what we think of in the U.S. as what is the, an attractive masculine body. And so yeah. I just thought oh, I would yeah. add that in. Uh, by the way, I'll put some links in the chat later when I'm finished here. I've got references to a lot of the things I'm talking about, but I wasn't aware of that one. That's that's good. Um, I'll, I'll pick that up and look at it for my next talk. <laughs> Unfortunately, these things take time and practice in a setting that encourages face-to-face -face contact and human-to-human -human interaction. And I would suggest that humans need the smells, the touch, the tone of voice to make a, a real possible connection. The time a person spends on the phone or the computer screen is time that is not used talking to a real human being, hearing their tone of voice, uh, listening to their stories, uh, watching how they react, look at their body language. 
uh, playing a playing a game together, playing a sport together. This real human contact is what our brains are programmed for. So our, our brains have been programmed to use all five senses to find a mate. The less opportunity to use our five senses, the less skilled many people will be in interpersonal skill development. And we already know that, I mean, some people are just naturally very skilled and they learn social skills really easily. Other people don't. Other people have a great deal of difficulty learning certain kinds of social skills. So we're already on a spectrum, if you will, of skill development. But then if you take away the ability to learn just through face-to-face -face and, and you're mainly on a computer, that really reduces opportunities for, for the social learning you, you need. So what does this have to do with incels and other groups? So first of all, let me define what an incels are. An incel is a member of an online subculture of people who define themselves as unable to get a romantic or sexual partner despite desiring one. So that's that's a formal definition. There's some other definitions. I, I thought that was probably the easiest one and most uh, best that I could find. If you study men who call themselves incels, and it's almost always men, men who complain bitterly that they cannot find a mate and that other men are taking all the possible mates uh, the incel group calls those chads. They're actually displaying signs of poor mating skills and unrealistic expectations about sex and attraction. If you listen to them or read what they write, they look and sound a lot like a bird that did not learn the proper songs for mating in their particular geographic area. Incels who claim that they are involuntarily celibate have language and behaviors that don't fit the mating world of today. And let me emphasize, the mating world of today. Much of what I read in incel language looks like what mating was 100 years ago, or even 50 years ago. But that's not the way mating works today. The behavior and rituals that will attract women have changed dramatically. And the men who learn the new behaviors will be successful. The men who have not learned will not be successful. They will be incels. There's actually some experiments. I don't have the reference for this. There's, there's an evolving culture of bird songs. In some areas, certain bird songs are more uh, attractive than other bird songs. And over a period of 50 years, uh, we have documentation through recordings of bird song culture evolving, changing. It sounds a lot like humans. I mean, our mating culture has changed a lot since I was a teenager. Mating cultures among birds the same way. In other words, a lot of animals are having the same problem that we're talking about here today. And it's you've got to pay attention to what the local uh, mating rituals are. So what has changed? Well, the ch what's changed is the power dynamic between men and women. Within a patriarchal society, women have few choices. They're restriction in action, movement, and agency. For example, it was as late as 1979 that women could not have a credit card without their husband's permission. Women were forced to have children. Women were not allowed to into many jobs or professions. Mating options for women were limited, sometimes even forced, as in arranged marriages, or you know, you get pregnant, you have to get married. The mating pool was often limited. Also, when, when women can only marry someone within their own race or their own ethnic group or their own religion, being single or, and, and, or so though that's one, one restriction that we, we had for, till very recently and still do in some areas. Being single or choosing not to have children wasn't an option either. I mean, 1959 or so was when birth control was first widely available. Before that, women had kids, whether they liked them or not. And it was very difficult to find uh, an abortion back then. I think we can all agree that these are good changes for women. At the same time, these changes have an impact on men. It dramatically challenges the way men interact with women and throws out the whole patriarchal rule book for finding a mate. The result can be seen in who is marrying and when they marry. Who can find a partner or partners and who cannot? 
men who identify as incels often express views of women mating and marriage that are based in patriarchal notions. The ideas they express would drive most women away. Things like women should be submissive. Women should stay in the hall. Men deserve sex. Women are evil. <laughs> Needless to say, most men don't hold these views, but the incel population seems to be deeply infected with these patriarchal ideas about sex and relationships. Now let's look at the impact of religion on this issue. Religion tends to impose a mating strategy for its own benefit. Regardless of our natural instincts or even sometimes our cultural practices, religion imposes itself. For example, women have been forced to marry men that they were not attracted to for centuries in the name of Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and other religions like Hinduism. So there, there's no genetics going on here, no, no uh, pheromones, no attraction. They're just, there's not normal sexual signaling. There's an imposition coming from religion. This can even be seen today in purity culture, where religion says there's no sex before marriage. You can't masturbate. You can't have lustful thoughts. You have to marry someone that you have very little information about and certainly no sexual experience with. In religious mating, you may not be responding to each other's based on normal signaling. Now, by signaling, I mean the smells, the touch, the sounds. You're not responding to those things that your brain is programmed to interact with, but you're responding more to religious expectations. I can't tell you how many people I've have told me in my career, how many people have told me that they got married to the entirely wrong person because their church expected them to get married, have kids, and raise their kids inside the religion without regard to attraction or attractiveness. So that's, that's, that was, <laughs> when I was growing up, I knew a whole lot of people that got married because, you know, the religion said you can't have sex. So they got married basically to have sex, and it was totally the wrong person. There was a hell of a lot of people got divorced out of the, my cohort uh, as, I was, as I was growing up. Now let's confirm hormones make uh, everybody seem attractive sometimes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and, you know, if I hadn't, if we, we as a group, I'm talking about my core, had been less constrained by religion, we probably would have been free to experiment a little bit and choose the right partner rather than the first partner. <laughs> That's kind of, because in my, in my circles, once you had sex, you were married. And if you got pregnant, you better marry each other. If it was, it was just that Im implied uh, pressure all the time. I love that. The right person rather than the first person. <laughs> I'm writing that down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now let's go one step further and realize that the reason religion imposes mating strategies is so religion itself will succeed. Not because you want to marry that person or are even attracted to that person. It's because religion wants children that will be indoctrinated into that particular religion. Uh, that's the whole one of the main reasons I wrote my book, uh, The God Virus. I, I extensively I write about it in that book. So religious mating strategies were actually very convenient for the male. And here's the interesting thing: it guarantees that men can get a mate. I want to underline that religion guarantees that men can get a mate. Now, I'm not talking necessarily about today's religion because religions are having to <laughs> dance real quick around some of this. But it wasn't that long ago that, you know, that's where you got your mates, most of the right within the religion. So to use our bird analogy, they didn't have to learn the songs. They didn't have to learn how to attract or be attractive. They just married who the religion told them to marry within the limited pool of candidates. They could impose them, the male, I'm talking about men, could impose themselves on someone under the guise of religious beliefs. This is still true in many countries, in both India with Hinduism and in Saudi Arabia with Islam. Women often have no choice. Men can use religion as a way to impose themselves. So we're kind of messing with the natural order of things when you don't let people uh, use their, their natural five senses to choose a mate. Now, fast forward to today. 
with the decline of religion, especially in Europe and North America, many religious practices have been eliminated. For example, we no longer promise to love, honor, and obey in wedding ceremonies. Most wedding ceremonies are egalitarian, even in religious wedding ceremonies. You almost never hear the love, honor, and obey bullshit anymore. I don't care what, I've been to a number of religious weddings. I haven't seen heard those words in 50 years, probably. So let's widen our understanding beyond just traditional religion, though. We need to also look at ideologies. Religion is an ideology, but it's only one kind of ideology. We are seeing ideologies among incels, but also other ideologies like the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers or the Christian Nationalists, and there's others. They're springing up all the time. These ideologies espouse ideas rooted in patriarchy, white supremacy, and Christian sexuality. It may seem obvious, but ideologies influence our biological choices. It's pretty obvious that white supremacy ideology prevents many people of different ethnic or religious or racial backgrounds from marrying each other. It wasn't that long ago that Catholics couldn't marry Protestants, Jews couldn't marry Catholics, and so on. Ideologies influence our biological choices. So how does this relate to our current subject? The ideology of incels, white supremacy, Christian nationalism will influence the choices someone makes. If they buy into male supremacy ideology, they have, they have a difficult time finding a woman who agrees with that ideology. They may be incels by virtue of the ideology they espouse. So they're, they're, if you read their stuff, it sounds like they're the victims. But when you look at what they're saying, you realize, <laughs> no, they're perpetuating. It's an ideology that has gotten into their brain. Now, I, I want to be careful there because I am not blaming these people. I'm not blaming an incel for their, their attitudes and beliefs any more than I blame a Catholic for their attitudes and beliefs or a Buddhist for their attitudes and beliefs. They're all infected with an ideology. One just happens to be religious. The other one, I don't know what we call it. But it's still it's still an infectious uh, virus, if you will. Uh, well, and I love the way you put that, Doctor Ray. That you know it it's an infectious ideology that gets in people's minds, and and I I definitely see the connection between you know this incel ideology and you know some of the evangelical uh, you know patriarchal beliefs that that are in some church cultures in the U.S. And I, I I'm kind of ruminating on on what you're saying ruminating is the wrong word i'm chewing on what you're saying here and i think that's a really insightful point i'm trying not to say interesting because it has come to my attention that i say that very often but i think that's a very insightful point that i think you it's make. interesting that you noticed that car <laughs> yeah really was it interesting very I interesting, yeah. interesting. <laughs> no but i i love that because um it's it's almost like I, I can see how it would be, you know, very disappointing to, you know, be not as successful at the mating strategy like you described. And isn't it tempting to grasp at this ideology that's floating around in the culture that you're in and, and say, ah, aha, I'm justified. There's not something wrong with me. There's something wrong with them. I right. I think that's, you made a really good point there. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I don't think we need to go a lot further to realize that ideology makes people even go against their most basic feelings. Uh, for example, a gay man or a woman marrying someone of the opposite sex due to religious pressure or ideological pressure. I can't tell you how many times in my career that I met gay men or women who married someone of the opposite sex and regretted it years later. They ignored their natural same-sex attractions or were forced to ignore them as a result of their ideology or their religion. So that's a you know, pretty important thing to see that ideologies can really overwhelm our natural biological instincts, if you will, or tendencies. I don't, maybe instinct isn't the right word. We can also note the bizarre behavior of some people infected with Catholic ideologies, specifically priests and nuns who become celibate. 
what could be more abnormal than forcing people to do the opposite of what their biology is pushing them to do? Now, what can we take from all this together? Um, let's start putting it around some a framework, if you will. Uh, what's going on, and not only with incels, but also with other male supremacy movements. For males and females, finding a mate is hard work. This is true of all species. Most species spend a lot of time and energy trying to find a mate. Whether a human, a beetle, a chimpanzee, or a rabbit, you got a lot of work to do if you're going to find a mate. Now let's look at the ideology being espoused within the male dominance culture movement, including incels, and the pickup artists, and the proud boys, oath keepers that I mentioned earlier. These ideologies are preaching ideas that will impact sexual behavior and their ability to attract. They're preaching almost literally in a religious sense that men should always be dominant, women should be submissive, men who don't display alpha male behaviors are less than real men. These ideologies also preach against masturbation and they berate men for self-pleasure. They preach that all men who are true alphas should get the most attractive women. I mean, this list, I could go on and on. I'm just giving the short list of what I see in, in the discussion groups and places where incels um, interact with themselves. <laughs> now, it will not be any surprise to you that these ideological ideas and expectations are pretty far out and radically against what most women are looking for in a mate in our current culture. If a man believes this ideological approach to mating he will also be so out of sync with women that he may never find a mate. The ideology also sets him up to be a poor caregiver, poor husband, poor father, and potentially abusive to any partner he might uh, actually connect with. This it, It's already hard enough to find a mate, but when you add all this baggage, it's impossible to find a mate. I don't know how, I mean, I, I do know some pretty misogynistic men who, I found a mate. I'm not saying it's impossible, but uh, it, you're you're adding difficulty um, points, I guess you could say, to use uh, to use the Olympic cat, you know, Olympic uh, scoring system. We can even see this ideology being publicly discussed and displayed in a recent post by Donald Trump, made to in praise of Nick Adams, a leader in alpha male culture. Nick Adams currently has over 2 million Facebook followers. Here's what he recently tweeted. This is what Nick Adams tweeted. This is what Donald Trump praised. Here's what, quote, when a woman is cooking dinner for me, here's how we split the responsibility. She cooks, I eat, she cleans, I head to Hooters. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I saw that video. I could not believe it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, okay, I'll just move on because I think that says enough. This is not a good mating strategy in a world where women are 66% of college graduates, 70% of medical students, and I think I read 70 plus percent of all valedictorians in high schools are, are women, and male college graduates have dropped from 70% to 40% since 1980. There's been a 30% drop in male college graduates in those um, 40 years. On the whole, women are now better educated than men. Better educated people tend to have higher standards for a mate, more awareness of their choices and their power in the world. Now, I'm most interested in the root causes of behavior, especially behavior that is counterproductive and hurtful to oneself or others. Women all over the world want a partner. Most of those women want a male partner. So the ideologies I've discussed hurt men and women alike. It prevents people from creating satisfying partnerships and having and raising children. It's a huge disconnect. This is a very difficult thing to discuss because it's e easy to fall into the trap of blaming one side or the other, of finding excuses for all sorts of behavior. I'm here more as a 
an observer as a scientist. I want to try and understand the behavior. I don't think it's helpful to, to point fingers and blame people. But our culture is changing very, very rapidly. The roles between men and women have radically, are, are radically different than they were 50 years ago. Men no longer have a clear path to partnership that was once available through patriarchal and religious training. Think about it. There was a clear path. When I was growing up, getting ready to get out in the real world, there was a specific path that I was taught very early on. Here's how you get a woman. So you get a mate when you should marry, I should have kids. All that was very clear to, to me and my cohorts. That has changed a lot. Women have new status in the society, which means they have choices they did not have 50 years ago. And you have to remember that in 1979, women couldn't even own a credit card without their husband's permission. I, I actually remember that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I date myself here, but I remember when women could not get a credit card without my, my wife could not get a credit card without my permission. And I was married at the time. Okay, I know this is a little bit off topic, but I want to dig into that. How did you feel about that at that time? Did you feel oh. like, oh, yeah, this is normal? Were you offended by it? How did you? Uh, oh, oh, my wife and I both thought it was bullshit. And we thought it was bullshit from the day we got married. I mean, we were both pretty liberal. Um, so, no, I, I never bought it. I've I've always had the curse of being liberal in a very conservative society. <laughs> Even as I was going to fundamentalist church, I never believed this stuff. I, I, that's another story, of course. But yeah, Ooh, that sounds yeah. like a topic for another talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I've given that talk some other places. <laughs> I love it. So these changes are not just superficial. They have fundamentally changed how men and women relate to each other and create an entirely new power dynamic that's unlike anything in Western history. Indeed, I would suggest even in world history. There have been cultures in the past that women had far more power. I'm not saying that, but on the vast majority of cultures in the last 5,000 years or so, that hasn't been the case. This change means that if men want to mate, they have to learn new songs, to use our songbird analogy. The old patriarchal ideas about mating, marriage, dating, sex simply don't attract women anymore. Just as adolescent male birds need an older male model to learn the right songs, male humans need male role models who will teach them the right ideas and attitudes that attract mates. Remember, I told you to remember that when I talked about it way early on in the talk about songbirds needing a close male mate, male mentor, probably their father. If an adolescent boy has a role model like Nick Adams that I mentioned earlier, the professional misogynist, or Enrico Terrio, the, the head of the Proud Boys, or a leader like Donald Trump, their model of mating, sex, and relationships will lead them down a dead-end path. They may become incels. So what has changed and why do I think this is so profound? There are many signs that boys are not thriving in our culture. Women have seen huge improvements in most areas, though there's still work to do, especially in places like the bo corporate boardroom and political representation. <clears throat> Here's some key indicators that may help illustrate the issue of boys and the difficulty boys are experiencing in uh, in North America right now, but also in other places. Since 2000, there have been a steady decline in high school graduation rates for men, as well as college enrollment and college graduation rates. Women have not only caught up with men in education, but have surpassed them significantly. 66% of college grads are women as of 2019. And as recently as 2019, about 74 men have received a bachelor's degree for every 100 men, uh, uh, every 100 women. So 74 men get a BA or B bachelor's degree and 100 women get one. Since 1974, women have consistently outpaced men in educational achievement. Among black women and men, black girls have virtually caught up with their white counterparts. 
in educational achievement, but black boys have fallen far behind. So in both white and black boys have fallen behind white or black women. Now let's talk about mental health. Mental health shows major differences between men and women. At early adolescence, suicide rates for boys and girls is about the same. By 25 years of age, boys are four to six times as likely to die by suicide. That's a hell of a big difference. A pew, uh, and moving on with mental health, a Pew uh, survey comparing 1990 to 2021, found that in 1990, 55% of men had six or more close friends. In 2021, only 27% had six or more close friends. In 1990, 3% of men had zero close friends. In 2021, 15% had zero close friends. That is an enormous difference, and it's a difference we find mainly in boys. Something is going on. Something is happening among boys. And, and to add insult to injury, so to speak, almost every day we see a young man involved in a mass shooting. In the majority of those cases, they have posted in some social media place or created a manifesto and those manifestos or the social media postings almost always rant about men being oppressed and women are evil or you know some version of misogynistic ideology again it's it's clear something is going on with men and boys i've been watching these statistics for most of my career i first became aware of this back in the 1980s when a friend of mine pointed some, some information out to me. But I haven't seen many people taking this idea seriously and exploring what it, it really means. And like I said earlier, I'll put some links to books and other resources uh, after I'm finished here. So we've talked about ideologies a bit, but every major religion tells men what their role is. And then of course we have thousands of years of literature, of tradition, of movies, of pop culture that are still telling men what and how, how they should behave. How do you read Shakespeare without finding out what a macho man looks like? <laughs> I mean, there's what piece of literature can we look at from anywhere, you know, in the last three or 400 years that doesn't have this Western style quote, um, I, I hesitate to call alpha male, but that's what they would call it. So the contrast between current reality and what men have been taught is confusing to many men. The result is many boys and men are desperately looking for models that they can learn from and be successful with in this new culture. The brains of men and women are programmed to look for mentors and models. Research shows that boys respond to male models, but much less to female models. The same is for women. Female models don't work for boys. Male models don't work for girls. So what happens when there are no male models in a boy's life? Think about that. When a boy has no male models in his life, the brain said there has to be... Our brains are really programmed to look for male models. If you've listened to Jack Wathy's talks, you'll kind of hear me repeating some of the stuff Jack Wathy has talked about. We have certain tendencies. Boys are going to tend to latch on to whatever model is available. In the absence of a real human, like a father or an uncle, many boys are going to look for models online. Unfortunately, many of the models online are teaching ideas that do not match with current reality. Whether white supremacists or incel, male dominance ideologies or pickup artists, positive role models are few and far between. Boys are surrounded by female teachers, but there are almost no male teachers in elementary schools. An eight year old boy would have, it would be impossible for an eight year old boy in second, third, or fourth grade 
to find a real male role model, unless he has a father or an uncle at home. Positive role models are, are so few and far between that they almost aren't non-existent to boys. That wasn't true 50 years, 100 years ago. Male mo role models were everywhere around boys. They have disappeared for many, many different reasons. Now I want to move on to a slightly different, uh, to a different topic that we'll find out is complementary, and that is the notion of social signaling. Social signaling can have a real strong impact on behavior. I will give you a story I just heard about two or three months ago. This is a PhD psychologist, a, a woman that I know. She was telling this story. She took her daughter, young daughter, to the doctor and came back that same day. And her young daughter starts playing with her young son. They start playing doctor, as children are prone to do. So, But the girl is the doctor, and the boy is the patient. After a while, the boy gets tired of being the patient. <laughs> he wants to be the doctor. He says, I want to be the doctor. And the girl says, boys can't be doctors. The woman overheard this conversation. And then she thought, every medical professional that her daughter had seen in her entire lifetime was woman. She had never seen a male doctor. That is social signaling. When I was growing up, I never knew a female doctor at all. I've had a female doctor for 25 years, but when I was growing up, they didn't exist or I had never heard of one. Men are told from early on in life that nursing is not masculine. So here's the interesting thing. We have a massive shortage of nurses in the United States. Yet there are hundreds of thousands of young men living in their parents' basements, not getting an education, while we struggle to find nurses. And many of those men call themselves incels. That is how strong social signaling can be and how it can hurt our entire society. Why are we telling boys nursing is not for them? We've been doing this for centuries. Even Florence Nightingale did not think men should be a nurses. Now, I know that was 150 years ago, but still, the, the tradition goes far, far back. Now, let me move to one other little piece. So, social signaling, is, I could go into a, Kara, I could go into a whole lecture just on social signaling, as I'm sure you could too, by the way. I'm putting you down on the calendar. We're doing it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Do, don't do that to me. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so looking at this whole thing, we've been looking at North America mainly, but I want to expand a little bit more because this is not just a U.S. thing. This is a cross-cultural thing. In Japan, they even call have a name for it called hikikomori. And, uh, Kara informs me that I almost get the pronunciation right. Oh, you got it. <laughs> so he can come more. So that was the that was the poll question, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So look at the, you know we didn't look at those poll questions, but we can. Do you want to pull them up? Not, not right now. I'm okay. on a roll. I don't want to do that we'll, just now. We'll do but, it at the end. <laughs> yeah, please remind me, girl. I'll yeah. forget it. Hikikomori is a phenomenon in which persons become reclusives in their own homes. They avoid, they're avoiding social situations. Uh, according to the Japanese government, up to 1 million men could be classified as hikikomori. Now, there are a few women, but it's a small percentage. It's almost all men. The ph phenomenon is seen as a serious issue, and it has also been researched in Japan, I mean, in, in European countries like France and Italy. There's actually research there as well. Several interesting hikikomori characteristics have been identified in the research, and they relate very closely to what we say we call incel phenomena. 70 to 80 percent of all hikikomori are men. Hikikomori and incels both spend the majority of their time online avoiding social interaction. Remember what we said about mating rituals and mating behaviors you ain't going to learn mating behaviors online and sitting in your mother's basement. Similar underlying issues between hikikomori and incels can be found, like mental health problems, such as social anxiety disorder. A high percentage of them could be diagnosed with some kind of anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder. Incels and hikikomori 
often claim they experience discrimination and alienation in society. They become afraid to leave their own homes. This is a pretty serious thing. And then when you move over to China, China has up to 23 million more men than women. It's a direct result of their one-child policy in which baby uh, female babies were systematically killed uh, in favor of males because their culture values males over females. So now we've got 23 million more men than women and this has led to some really devastating social consequences. Many of these men feel disconnected from the society. They're very discouraged. They literally have no hope of finding a mate. They can work their butts off and still not achieve anything. Women in China will not marry a man that doesn't own a house. That, that's pretty much the way it's been going. And there's a lot of research that's been happening in the last five years about this phenomena. But marriage is a very different thing. In, in uh, China, and it's it's predicated on males owning a property. Well, um, if there's 23 more million men, then they're competing for a lot smaller group of women. And and in getting discouraged, they stop they stop trying. And this is called they even have a name for it. It's called laying flat. The Chinese government was so concerned about this that they even appointed a commission to looking into the laying flat movement. So what do we do with this information that I've been exploring with you? Where are we gonna go with it? Well, first I think it's important to admit that men and boys are struggling. Just as the male songbird needs older males to learn proper songs, so do human males need older males. If you're a parent of a boy child, help him find role, role models. Try to keep fathers and father figures in your boy's life. So I think for all the benefits of all the, all the benefits that the women have, have shown and the ability to choose who they want or don't want to be married to, the loser in this in this equation, the winner in the equation is daughters. Daughters seem to do fine. Daughters do fine in families, in single parent mother families. Boys do not do nearly as well. However, if the boy's father stays engaged, or if there's another male that stays engaged with that single mother's boy, the boy does fine. There's actually good research on this as well. So we should recognize that incels and other groups are likely a product of young men trying to find the models. If all that's available is the proud boys and oath keepers, that is where the boys are going to go for their model. It is a way of it's because humans have this desire, need, and programming, and we've had it for hundreds of thousands of years. This is not an individual moral problem. As, as many people try to frame it, it's not a moral problem. It's a result of massive social change and the response of males to that change. We can, we can hold two thoughts in our mind at the same time. We can celebrate the incredible gains of women while also acknowledging that men need a new roadmap, a new understanding of how to relate to women in society, how to be a man in this culture, how to be a father, a role model for their children. So I don't have a lot of solutions to the issues I've discussed, but I think it's important to see the problems so we can be conscious and intentional about helping boys become better socialized in this new society. Fortunately, humans are flexible. We can learn new ideas and behaviors. And we're highly influenced by our circumstances, of course, and our culture and environment. But that is not our destiny. So here are some things I would, I would suggest. I'm not, I'm not going to call them solutions. I'm calling them actions that may or may not help, um, help correct some of this imbalance that's come with, with boys being, uh, and where we've, describe boys. First of all, there's some good research that shows many boys benefit by being held back from school by one year. Not putting boys in with girls. Girls mature faster. Mature uh, girls fit into our current educational model much better than boys. Boys need more time, a little bit more time to mature. And so the research shows hold boys back a year. They actually may thrive and, and do better. 
Second, and this is this is um, interesting, I think. When I was growing up in elementary school, we actually had some male teachers. I challenge you to find a male teacher almost anywhere in our educational system uh, below the uh, below seventh grade or so. Almost every teacher you come across is female. Every administrator almost is female. And there was a study recently that asked um, parents, would what what do you think of having a man as your child's third grade teacher? The vast majority, I forget the statistic, but like 81% of the parents said, I would take my child out of that class. Okay, think about that. Where are the role models going to be when parents won't let a male teach their child? Why are males not qualified to teach children? Males are qualified to have children and be fathers. It comes from a myth that I see a lot of, and that is the myth that all men are predators. I see that repeated, unfortunately, in a lot of places. Well, once that myth gets placed in the heads of parents, they're going to have a hard time letting go and seeing the value of men being in their elementary schools. So that's one of my pet peeves. I know a lot of people, a lot of males that would probably be excellent, excellent teachers. Generally, get more males in boys' lives. Here's the deal. Girls are surrounded with female models. And the research shows they respond to female models. A good, strong female model inspires other girls. It has the exact opposite effect on boys. Female models don't resonate with boys. Boys need male models. Whether that's a teacher, a gym coach, uh, you know, I don't care, uncle, they need models. Fourth, you've heard the term boys will be boys. Well, I'm gonna, I want to change that term. I want to get rid of that term. Boys will be human. Stop making boys sit all day in school. Don't shame boys for wanting to rough, roughhouse and fight and wrestle and get out and run. That's what boy bodies want to do. Now, girl bodies might want to do it too, but I guarantee you most boy bodies need to be out in the middle of the school day running, yelling, screaming, roughhousing. That's what our species has always done. And, and I'm not saying girls can't and shouldn't do that, but boys absolutely need that. The vast majority of boys need lots of exercise. In fact, exercise in the middle of the day, not, not at the end of the day, <laughs> They will come back to school ready to study, ready to engage if their, their energy level has been expended a little bit. Encourage boys to play and generally do what their biology wants them to do. Our culture, there's a myth in our culture that boys and girls are the same. And I know most of us probably don't believe that, but it's out there. The fact is, boys' hormones are different their development of Britain, their brain development is different. So let's honor that difference and let boys be human. We pejoratively said boys will be boys, and I want to change that to boys will be human. It doesn't mean they behave, that we're going to teach them or allow them to be inappropriate or predators or anything like that. We're just not going to restrict them to a model that doesn't work for boy bodies and boy brains. For example, put recess back in the school. So many schools have basically eliminated recess or made it so tiny it's useless to the boys who need to get rid of that energy. Six, begin teaching in a way that is gender neutral and treats gender as fluid. Stop forcing boys into a patriarchal model. Stop forcing girls into the same model. It's lots of teachers are unconsciously and infected with this idea that um, you know of the gender binary so we need to start teaching teachers how to be more gender neutral in the way they they teach children let's consider what i'm i'm going to call i've never heard this term before but let's consider this let's consider gender liberation let's teach boys and girls that they can express themselves as they wish rather than in the patriarchal box this would have all kinds of benefits 
for trans people, for non-binary people, and it would reduce the violence and aggression based on religious ideas about sex and sex roles. I, I just think this one thing would be, it's hard to implement, but children, let children be who they are and let them discover who they are without trying to impose external social, um, social norms and rules on them. And last, challenge religious notions of sexuality. The Bible and the Quran are not valid models for human sexuality. So that's all I got to say, Kara. Thanks, everyone. I, I hope this has opened some avenues for you guys to think about, and uh, we're glad to answer a few questions as and long I, as my voice holds up. I was tracking the time, and you did exactly an hour since you started talking. Very good. Wow. Well, I'm surprised. I, th I thought with the questions, it would really took me over, but all right. No, no. Good. We have time for questions, and we have plenty, and we'll do the... Uh, the written ones first, and then we'll move to the hangout after that. And uh, do you think you'll be able to stick around for the hangout? Yeah, I'll stick around for a while. My voice is a little rough. I don't know okay. why, but uh, we'll, we'll give you a break in between the, the questions okay. and the hangout. But we do have quite a few, so we'll get through as many as we can. And uh, I guess Rob and I will trade off answering them. So um, th okay, this you, has go, been... you go. You go first. Okay. All right. Sounds good to me. And uh, I'm just going to say this has been a very lively chat uh, during this talk. There's been a lot of discussion and interest in this, and we have a lot of questions. So I love it. We've had a lot of engagement. So uh, the first question that I will ask is, uh, someone was wondering, do you think a large percent of incels are neurodivergent? And do you know of any data or resources about this? Uh, there's been some preliminary research on it, I believe. Uh, and yes, I would say a pretty good percentage of them are neurodivergent. And even if they're not diagnosed, they have tendencies, I'm pretty sure. Now, I don't think there's been good research on this yet. So I'm not claim making any hard and fast claims. But from my experience, what I've seen, what I've read, what I've heard, and some preliminary research, I, I would, I'm pretty sure a significant percentage. What that percentage is, I don't know. Could be 50%, it could be 20%. Fair enough. So more research is needed for, for any uh, budding researchers out there. Get on this, y'all. Okay, so the next question is rather lengthy, but I like it also. I'm going to read it. Being an incel creates the us versus the world effect and further deepens their ideology. Like conspiracy theorists feeling special and unique, being separate from everyone. The, their camaraderie in the suffering within a group. There is camaraderie in the suffering of the group. Mm -hmm. So the catch 22 is that if they do get a girlfriend, then they're outed from this community because they're no longer an incel by definition. Like you can't make any personal growth because changing any of your misogynist opinions is met with rejection by your only social group. So there's motivation to stay that way. What effect do you think all of that has on the number of incels? Uh, there's actually pretty good evidence oh. that that keeps people in there uh, for a while. Um, I, again, I think the research, there's a lot of need for this, but I've read several papers on this. And one of the hopeful things uh, that I did read, and don't ask me the source right now, I didn't, I might be able to find it. I, I think I've got it in my notes. It was that many people who call themselves incels come into these communities and they get, they're very active in interacting. And a lot of them, you know, they experience what you just described in, in certain social norms. And if you violate those norms, like getting a girlfriend, you get kicked out. You certainly can't brag about anything. You can't say what you've, you know, if you've been successful. But so many, uh, one of the researchers noted, because they did a frequency, uh, frequency analysis of how many times various people interacted on, on the forum. And what they found was that m men would come in and engage pretty intensely for about three months, and then they would disappear. They would stop interacting. Now, the researchers couldn't tell if they disappeared by way of just leaving or if they just got silent. They weren't sure which one it was. But it, it seemed like most of the participants stopped participating after about three months of fairly intense involvement. So that's kind of a hopeful sign. Maybe they saw, maybe they saw this is going nowhere or it just makes me feel bad or it just... You know, 
act, antagonizes my depression. You know, who knows why they left? But that's the only thing I know, Rob. I um, hope that answered a little bit of the question. Okay. Uh, so the next one is, does military enrollment among men and women have anything to do with suicide stats? Presumably more men enroll in the military and thus go on to commit suicide. I wasn't aware there was a connection between the military and suicide. So is, is that correct, first off? Yeah, first off, the military has a big problem with suicide. And yes, they're, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert, don't know a lot about it. I've got friends that have worked in that area, specifically Dr. Hector Garcia, who's been on this show before. Uh, so, so that's an interesting question that from that because clearly younger people join the military and if yeah. it's mostly men and they have a higher suicide that might in, in fact influence the incel uh, the, the general suicide rate between men and women yeah i don't know I'm, i've not seen any connection there um you got to remember that our our military is tiny compared to what it was 50 years ago Mm -hmm. And so the number of people who have actually been in the military is actually very, very small. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, but that's a whole nother subject. I, I don't have a good answer to that question. I'm not. Uh, my answer is I don't know. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. And that's a good answer if you don't know. <laughs> uh, so another question is, do you think there is this dismissive attitude towards young men and boys in dealing with mental health and finding their way in society? I think that's the big problem that is unaddressed, unannounced, unrecognized. Yes. Uh, you know, we have a tradition of saying boys shouldn't cry. Boys shouldn't express their feelings. You know, that that's that's kind of a surface level uh, symptom of how we treat boys mental mental health. And I see a lot of dismissiveness in uh, in, in school systems. Girls are much more open to to uh, getting treatment for mental health parents are much more willing to pay for the mental health treatment of, of girls that is not true of boys boys don't get the attention and we don't take the symptoms of depression in boys are not are not the same as symptoms of depression in girls it, it boys are taught to hide their depression Girls don't hide their depression as much usually. Now I'm, I'm being I don't want to overgeneralize here, but the, I'm just saying here's some of the problems that we face in trying to help boys through this time. Adolescent boys face a lot of pressure. They're supposed to be learning all this stuff. I mean, adolescence is where you learn how to mate, where you learn how to create relationships. And if you're not successful, you ain't going nowhere later. I mean, that's the fear, of course. And then there's the peer pressure of, of boys saying, well, you're a wuss, you're a homo, you're this or that. There's all sorts of denigration based on sex and sexuality in the, in the locker room. And that can exacerbate mental health problems, of course. And then nobody, the school counselor doesn't pay attention to the kid when he comes in and talking about, you know, their experience. And quite frankly, <laughs> um, gym coaches are the worst. Jim, Jim, I look and I watch. I'm unfortunately I'm involved and inter interact with some pretty high level coaches in my career, and they can be pretty. Um, let's just say they're not good role models for how to treat women sometimes, and boys pick that up and they bring it onto the football team, or they pick it up and they bring it onto the basketball team. There's 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 real issues there, and. I mean, it all wraps up into how do we treat boys' mental illness? How do we listen to boys? How do we take boys seriously when they're experiencing emotional problems? It's There's a big gap between how we treat girls and how we treat boys in that area. That might be encompassed by the phrase cowboy up as opposed to cowgirl up. No one would say that. Nobody. You're absolutely right, Rob. Right, yep. right. Just suck right. it up, right? Yep. All right. A, a rather long question here, which uh, starts with something which I don't know. Is hey, true, but... I, I just want to say these are hmm. excellent questions. I'm 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 thank you. These are good questions. Do we always <laughs> say we have such smart people who attend RFRXs. This proves it. Yep. We were just talking about that in the pre-show. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we were. All right. So long, this one, it's uh, it says claims that and you'll confess address if the assumption here is correct. And then there's a question about it. Studies show 
that the more a man adheres to traditionally masculine gender roles, the least likely he is to do well in school or graduate, the least likely he is to seek mental health treatment, and the more likely he is to develop antisocial tendencies, especially when he grows up in a home with violent punishments from his parents. There's a lot of claims in there. What can we do to reverse this course and help society to change the narrative on masculinity by connecting it to more pro-social behaviors that promote healthier academic and mental health outcomes? Uh, dang, I could write a doctoral dissertation on that. <laughs> Rob. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. That's um, that's a tough question. I so, so, so were, were the premises correct there? Study show more, so, more man ears, all that, and, and therefore do worse. Is that true? Yes. Uh, in, in a broad brush, yeah, from my experience and my knowledge, it's I would say broad brush, it's correct. I, okay. I I don't have any sources. I couldn't cite the studies or anything yet. So so that, so then but, we have a, 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 a asking for a big answer here. What can society do to reverse this course <laughs> and help to change the narrative on masculinity? Yada yada yada. Well, it just it kind of dovetails with what I said, um, what I've talked about here, and that is the 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 hundred year old masculine role model is still being taught today. It's still being modeled today. It's still in our literature today. And some people are going to absorb that. And they're going to try and find mates based upon that model. And there are still women. Let's not, I'm not going to bullshit you. There's still women that respond to that kind of behavior. And yes, that kind of behavior does oftentimes lead to child abuse, to spousal abuse, to rigid, rigid patterns of social relationships within the marriage or the family um so i i don't know where to quite where to go with that rob i'm just saying there's there's evidence that what they say is right now okay. what can we do i think what we can do is some of the things i mentioned the eight things i i went through and, and that is start um we have we have programs I, I was in corporate America for almost 35 years, and I watched corporate America emphasize training in, in sexual harassment, training in diversity. I watched, I mean, major, I was involved with major Fortune 500 country, companies. If You would recognize virtually every name I would mention if I mentioned my former clients. Every one of these companies through the the 1980s, 1990s, to the early 2000s was going through this transformation to diversity, inclusion, sexual harassment, and they still are. I'm not saying they're finished. Yeah, anymore. I had to take a sexual harassment course every year. I got really good at understanding how to do it if I wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't start practicing, please. <laughs> so what I'm saying is corporate America has got its act together. I can name huge companies that took this very seriously and now make people go through this training. They've got ways to hold people accountable. What I don't see is that same kind of awareness. Now, I'm not saying it's not happening. I, for example, my partner, Barb, had to go through diversity training just, just a week or so ago. And, and she takes, as you know, you know, Barb, she takes that shit seriously. She could teach the course probably better than they could. But I, I think there's a, a lot of room in the educational system to, to train teachers in some of the stuff I talked about. You know, how can we do gender neutral training, uh, teaching with, with children? How do we treat kids who are, you know, are neurodiverse? Because lots of there's lots of things going on there that we could teach teachers. And I would submit especially coaches. I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but I think coaches are the are the uh, quintessential male patriarchal role models that are still in those kids' lives. They're not, they're, and, and I think that is the source of a lot of misogyny in our educational system. I mean, just look at some of the scandals we've seen in college coaches. It's it's rife. It's everywhere. Assistant coaches. There's been a lot of scandals over the years with with that kind of group. Anyway, yeah, thank that's you. that's my non-answer there, uh, Rob. That was a tough one. Car, take the next one. 
Yeah, so we had a couple of similar questions on this part, so I'll, I'll kind of ask both of them together, but people were wondering about when you were talking about how uh, boys don't seem to respond to women as role models, and so someone was wondering why is that that boys would reject women as role models um and is there some reason that they would think that a woman is not a good enough role model for them and then a, a similar question was given what we know about two mother households having good results raising sons how do we square this apparent contradiction to the other data about boys needing male role models well there's there's actually some pretty big research projects um, that are referenced in uh, one of the books I'll put up here. Uh, the fact is that our brains are designed to find the models that are going to make us successful. A, a male, I mean, go back 5,000 years. If you're a hunter gatherer in, in West Africa, the male role model is going to be the one that teaches you how to kill the animal to bring it back to the family. The female role model is not going to do that. If you want to learn how to grind the corn, you got to go through the female role models to do that. It seems that our brains are pretty programmed to latch on to whatever role model is seems appropriate to that brain. It's it's not unlike, like I said, what Jack Wathy talked about the innate model of the mother. We have some innate tendencies. I think the research on two mother households is still pretty nascent. I, I don't deny it. I don't think it's wrong necessarily, but I, I need to understand more what those research projects are looking at, how big they were. Were there other male role models in, in the um, life of the kid? I mean, there's a lot of factors you'd have to account for in those studies. I'm not. I'm not making a judgment one way or the other, but I am saying the studies that show where males stay involved with the boys, the boys do better. Um, boy, I, I, I'm trying to draw. I'm drawing a blank on the name of the of the book. I'll again, I'll reference it. One of the one of the studies. Well, I, I'm not going to go any farther with that. There's plenty of research to suggest boys need. Boys need men and, and girls need women. In, in fact, I don't think that's such a radical idea, but but um yeah, anyway, that's all. <laughs> that's my non-answer to that question. I'm pretty good at these non-answers. If I can find if I can find that reference, I'll bring it up real quick, but I, I don't want to hold us up. Go ahead and ask the next question. Okay, so um, how realistic is psychology and therapy as help for people who struggle with socialization, especially against the way it was put here, with societal headwinds of how difficult it is to find community as an adult? Well, uh, let me draw upon some of the good research on neuro neurodivergence and different models for teaching those mainly adolescents and children, there, there's some pretty good evidence that if you use, if the therapist has the right training and uses the right tools, you can take a child with pretty, pretty serious social deficits in terms of learning, ability to learn social signals, and you can teach them how, through alternative, you can reprogram the brain to bring that through to allow them to um, learn how to socially integrate and socially interact with people. The brain is still pretty plastic. I mean, even adults can learn these skills, but it takes dedication and it takes a therapist that has some training on how to do that. So my answer is therapy can really, really be valuable. And I'll, I know from personal experience, I had a good friend with, um, with a neuro, well, actually now that I think of, I've got two good friends with, very neurodivergent uh, kids, both boys in this case, and they both had a, a good therapist. I'm familiar enough with the therapist to know some of the techniques. And I have watched those two boys really go from virtually not unable to function socially to, you know, average. They're never going to be geniuses in social interaction, but they can 
they can interact in a social environment and not be intimidated. Uh, so I've seen it personally, but I also know from the research, you can do that, but it obviously costs money and needs a good therapist that knows what they're doing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, I am going to go to this next question. There were also a few uh, similar questions along these lines. And uh, basically the question is, what about the feminist perspective? And I guess this is a very particular feminist perspective, uh, but uh, definitely one that is out there, that men have brought this upon themselves. In other words, they've made their own beds based on this kind of patriarchal male supremacist view and the fact that it's not working for boys now, well, that's the logical outcome. Uh, what do we, what well, do you think about under, that perspective? The, the underlying assumption of the question is that somebody has control. And I don't think a five-year-old boy um, being brought up in a patriarchal religious family or culture has any consciousness about what's going on or how they're learning. And so when they grow older, and they act like their fathers, who is their closest role model. Is it any surprise they perpetuate that role model? That's pretty obvious and pretty um, much the way human culture works. So I think the premise of the question is wrong. Nobody was in control. Nobody designed this, uh, even though even though it's clearly had had real advantages for males. And I'm not saying the males, once they got old enough to be conscious, didn't continually con and even consciously perpetuate it. But I don't think most men are like that. Most men aren't that conscious of, you know, of how they behave or how they were taught. It's like religion. I mean, it's exactly like religion in this sense. No five-year-old sitting around thinking, mom and dad, uh, why are you teaching me a Baptist? I should be a Buddhist instead. No, no kid does that. They just accept whatever's in the environment. The environment says you're a Catholic. Your environment says you're a Baptist or a Hindu. Whatever the environment says, that's what you, and you could be a, you could be that person, Hindu or Baptist the rest of your life and never question it once. That's what's going on here. Whatever you're being programmed with at about five or six years old is probably going to last you the rest of your life for most people. Now, if you're sitting in this meeting right now with us, you are one of the exceptions. <laughs> and, and that's why we don't have 5,000 people in this meeting. We've only got 41 in this meeting because <laughs> it takes a hell of a lot of self-awareness to even want to ask the questions that we're talking about here today. So I think it's a, it's a fool's errand to blame people for what they had no control over. It, it, actually, it actually diverts attention from teaching people skills and teaching people how to become more more self-aware so i i would object to the premise of the question to begin with i want to i want to comment i want to comment men and women and neurodivergent people and trans people and lgbtq people i don't care what kind of people you are i want to come at you with compassion and empathy and try to understand who you are and where you're coming from and if I'm going to say, well, you're, you created this problem, it's all your fault, <laughs> I ain't going to get very far. Nobody wants to hear that, especially when they know damn good and well. It wasn't, they didn't decide which religion to be taught or what patriarchal ideas to accept. They just got them. They, they just got put in their brains. It's much more compassionate, Kara, to listen and understand than it is to blame and point fingers and um, in this case, blame the victim. I was a victim of a lot of bad patriarchal ideas. And I probably, no, I know I perpetuated some of them when I was younger. So I'm not going to, but I, I'm not going to say I was responsible. I just learned them. I had to unlearn, but it took years to unlearn some of that stuff. I'm still learning shit. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think a point that we've seen come up a few different times in the chat this evening has been that, you know, this patriarchal male supremacy stuff, it hurts everybody. It's bad for everybody. And uh, it sounds like the the person that was asking this question uh, put a little bit of context to it that, you know, they're thinking from the perspective of a non-male person who has been, you know, on the receiving end of some of the 
the violence and oppression that that comes with these ideas they're kind of looking at it from that angle oh, oh okay I, I i don't pay attention to the chats i just listen to the question but thank you i'm glad to hear that um mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's a tough issue i mean it really is i mean i yeah it's bad for everybody so yeah okay good points um i think rob uh you're up next yeah, so we're going to ask one more question, I think. But yeah, before I ask that question, since uh, Dr. Ray doesn't read the chats, I'll just let you know that you were somebody here, I won't read their name, but they said they would love to see you give this talk for the Human Society of Santa Barbara, on, and they gave a date and everything. So I'm going to ask that person to DM you. <laughs> okay. And, and maybe you can read it after, after the seg segment is done. Okay. All right. So the last official question, at least for me, is how can males be taught that having qualities associated with females doesn't mean they're gay? Oh man. Uh, well, I'm, again, I, I'm not sure the premise of the question is. I, I wouldn't use that as the as the premise. The underlying premise, I would question. What I think we should do is to help people uh, explore their own sexuality, and whether they're gay or not, or whether a specific behavior fits the stereotype of gay or not is irrelevant. Let's learn, let's learn and teach, especially our boys, because there's a lot of homophobia among especially adolescent boys. Let's try as parents and as teachers to teach adolescent boys what sexuality is, and that you have control over your own sexuality, and there's no such thing as there's no the stereotypes are not are not kind to us. They they put us in boxes. So I don't know, Rob, do you have a different understanding of the question or do you think I'm missing something? No, no, there? no, 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 I think you that that I think you got it. Here's my rule of thumb, and it's a hard rule of thumb to learn and to, to practice. And I, and I have not achieved perfection here. I'm not claiming that. Try to approach things with compassion and empathy. All the while being aware that there are people that play games and you know there are bad actors. I'm not I'm not make, thinking all humans are wonderful. But you're generally going to be more right, a lot more right than wrong if you approach humans with compassion and and uh, empathy. The the one out of a hundred or the one two out of a hundred bad actors are not worth the ninety nine that you want to try and help. So, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Kara, you want to ask one more, or are we done with this segment? Well, I think we are about out of time. There are some more questions that we didn't get to, but if we did not get to your question, I apologize. It was not that we skipped it on purpose. And if you want to stick around for the Hangout, please feel free to bring it up there. And we'll move to the Hangout here in just a minute. But I do want to make sure that we have time to wrap up. And we're going to have Helen come on and give us a couple of announcements here in just a second. So let's do that. Also, uh, there was one other question, uh, Dr. Ray. Uh, did you have some links and resources for us? Yeah, I, to share? I had them and then I lost them. I'll go back and get them. Um, I'll okay. put them up here right now as soon as I can find them. Okay, perfect. Yeah, feel thanks free for to take your Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, and also I uh, am being reminded too that we promised to share the results of the poll. So let me go yeah, ahead and yeah. do that. Okay, so let me pull that up and I'll go ahead and read them for those who are listening. So the first question was, how many close friends do you have? And 22% of people said zero. 63% answered three or less. 6% answered six or less. 3% answered 10 or less. And 6% answered more than 10. So the vast majority of people were on three or less or zero. And then the second question, what is hikikomori? 9% of people answered a Buddhist murder mystery. 75% of people correctly answered a term for men who have withdrawn from society. 13% answered the main character in a Mishima novel. And 3% said a very cheap brand of sake. And in answering what is an incel, 
Uh, only two answers were chosen. 6% of people answered a man who has not had sex in at least 10 years. And 94% of people have apparently heard of this before because they answered someone who is involuntarily celibate. <laughs> so we, we have people who read coming to rfrx <laughs> or, or they googled it before uh, before the meetings after <laughs> also could be that and yeah, that's right. okay too okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh then we had which of these concepts is included in the phrase boy crisis three percent answered the decline in boy bands 78 percent got the precipitous drop in male high school and college graduation rates 3% picked lack of male representation as Hollywood film leads, and 16% actually answered alarmingly low birth rate of boys in recent years. I'm very so, proud of the two of them. They've got a combined 6%. Hey, Rob's over here tricking people. <laughs> and then we had one final question. Who has the higher suicide rate at age 25 in the U.S.? Is it men, women, or is that about even? And 94% of people answered men. And 3% each answered the other two choices. So most people picked out the expected answer on that one. So yeah, there is a little difference in that one because uh, uh, some studies show that women have more suicide attempts, but men are the more likely to have successful suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that varies by study, but yeah. Anyway. yeah I, would, I would speculate that that's because of choice of suicide method. Um, yeah, it... it, it Maybe right? more men have guns. And I think I just saw something about the amount of suicides in the United States and what percent are by guns. It's like at least half or maybe more than that. Yeah, and, right. And, and I think you're generally more successful if you do that than if you take pills or something like that. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I have also read and I need to go check my sources on this, too, because this could be old information. But similar to what Rob was saying, I remember reading at one point, too, that a lot of times women will tend to choose methods. And I'm sorry, trigger warning. We're talking about suicide if you want to log off or, or mute for just a second we'll i'll wave my hands like this when we're done <laughs> uh it, i i also read information similar to what rob was saying about how sometimes women will select a, a method that they hope will be um less troublesome for people who find them and mm. sometimes those methods end up being less successful like you mentioned taking yeah. pills or or something like that so Maybe there could be some effect there, but I don't have recent research on that either. So I'm going to be looking that up. Okay, wave your hands. Okay, I'm now waving my hands. We're done with that. You can come back on. Okay. All right. Uh, where were we? Um, I think we were. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Ray, whenever you have some links for us, uh, let I, me know. I, and... I put them all up. Oh, look, you're way ahead of me. Okay. There we go. Uh, in that case, uh, let us move on to wrap up here. And uh, I am super excited to check out these resources as well. You're adding to my reading list that I'll never get to the end of. So thank you for that. <laughs> and thank you for sharing all of this with us. This has been really interesting and thought provoking. And we have had a lot of discussion going on in the chat. I think it's a topic that people are interested in learning more about. So thank you for starting off that conversation with us. And we will be back again next week with another episode, same bat time, same bat channel. And next week we are going to have Mr. Atheist, a.k.a. Jimmy Snow, who is the executive Ooh, producer. exciting. Yes. He is part of the Colin show, The Line, which he says he does to pay for his true passion, which is making ergonomic wooden work from home furniture for ferrets. <laughs> I, I think that's a joke. And he's also allegedly an ex-Mormon. And will discuss with us about hopefully all of the above. So join us for that next week. It is going to be a good show, I think. And if you want to get more RFRX in your life between now and then, and who wouldn't, check out some of the recordings of our previous episodes. You can find them on YouTube at this link I'm dropping in the chat now or wherever you get your podcasts. And as I and mentioned, mine is premiering tomorrow. Yes, yes. Don't miss that one. It's a good one. I remember it. <laughs> and if you have ideas for future topics you'd like to see covered on a show or other questions or comments, you can email us at rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. And don't forget to check out the blog and the podcast. And Rob, do you want to tell people where they can find us on the social media? Oh, yeah, we're all over social media. We got Facebook, which is uh, Recovering From Religion, duh. We got a Facebook support group, which is facebook.com slash RFR support group project. And we've got the Twitters, 
uh, that's rfr.org, and we got Instagram, also rfr.org, and we got TikTok. So, so far, we're not on Truth Social for some reason. Uh, we'll see what happens. I love it. Okay, well, uh, be sure and like and follow and subscribe and share and all that. And speaking of wanting to hear from all of you fine people, I want to launch our exit poll which helps us understand how you liked and found the program this evening helps us know what to do more of what we can do to improve and so please feel free to answer the following questions they are anonymous Uh, they're statements they're not questions the first statement is this program was relevant to me answer choices are on a one through five scale with one being not at all relevant i already left which may skew our results, and five being very much relevant. Uh, Statement number two, the speaker was clear and understandable on the same scale of one through five. Number one is, as Helen says, banana phone, not understandable. And number five was very clear and understandable. Uh, Answer choice, question three, no, statement three. Okay, I'll get this one day. I I I need an explanation of this. What is a banana phone? I, I'm judging from context clues that it means it is not operating very well. But uh, Helen, can you give us an actual definition of what a banana phone is? Does this have to do with Ray Comfort and his description of the banana proving God, or is there something else involved? <laughs> okay, so the banana phone is like you know how people like will pretend they're on the phone with a banana. <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> know people what, like that. Maybe you well, do. you didn't grow up in the circles that I did. Okay. <laughs> So it turns out bananas are, do, are, are you, not are, good at also at for shitty phone. phone. You can always say tin cans. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like when you have the cans connected by a string. Yeah, that I get. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. so that's answer choice one. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. If you, that's why I'm here to give definitions. <laughs> Thank you, and to make us cooler. Yes, that's I'm the coolest yes. distributor. Yes. <laughs> Okay, and the final question, number four, how did you find RFRX tonight? Answer choices are through the RFR online community or Slack channel, through a meetup event, through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, through Discord, through the RFR website, or other. And we still are getting answer choices, which are other, so please feel free to let us know in the chat uh, what the other is.